Welcome to the first of a series of Health Tree webinars about how to use Health Tree. My name is Jenny Alstrom. I'm Paul Alstrom. And Paul is obviously my husband. I'm the, I'm the support team. <laughs> and we are here to share um, how to use Health Tree. We've had a lot of new users on Health Tree just recently with the COVID study and also with um, some of the carrier form masks that they're donating. And we're super excited to share this section. So the way we'll do it is we'll do an individual webinar on each section of Health Tree, and this is just the first one. Um, before we get started, I'd like to provide some introductions. So um, my husband and I um, had this idea for Health Tree, and we'll explain a little bit about why we created Health Tree. But also with us are uh, Anna Sagoon, and she is uh, the head of patient experience here. Say, so. say hi, Anna. <laughs> hi. <laughs> Um, if you're in the chat or you're talking about um, your medical records and whatnot, you are going to be interacting a lot with Anna's team. Uh, we also have Todd Foster with us. Say hi, Todd. Hey, everybody. Todd is our head of um, product. So he's helping us define new requirements. And he has a background with um, at MD Anderson. And he was there for 12 years on patient experience in their tech department at MD Anderson. So he understands cancer a lot and um, is, is great. And we, uh, we have a very dedicated team that can help you on Health Tree. So we're really, really excited. So what I'd like to start with first is I'll share my screen and um, we'll give you a little bit of background first. about why we created Health Tree. So first, just a couple of little reminders. Uh, we have some radio programs and also a round table program coming up. So we have a COVID antibody show that should be really interesting with Dr. Stephen Russell. He was actually at the Mayo Clinic and um, developed the measles vaccine for myeloma, but now he's working on a COVID antibody test that just um, detects neutralized antibodies. So that'll be really interesting. We'll do an update with Dr. Paul Richardson of Dana-Farber and about ASCO because ASCO is this huge virtual meeting this year. Um, we'll also do EHA, which is um, the European Hematology Meeting. And there will be a lot of myeloma content on there. So we will um, show you that. But first we wanna talk a little bit about why we created Health Tree because the why behind it um, and the why behind the reason the whole team works on it is um, very mission driven towards just helping patients. So I'm gonna turn it over to Paul because this is um, Paul's brother and our experience with Helltree actually didn't really start with my diagnosis. It started with his brother's diagnosis of AML. Hi everyone. 15 years ago, my younger brother, David, was diagnosed with acute myeloid, myeloid leukemia, AML, and they call it the killer. Uh, at the time, there was less than a 3% survival rate. And David had a young family, six kids, uh, five boys and a girl, just like our family, and was given uh, a very low chance of surviving. And I remember the call with the doctor. He said, well, you can try a chemotherapy or you can try a transplant. And we we're such, in such shock, we, you know, we said, well, let's, well, let's try the Transplant sounds scary, so let's try the chemotherapy. And what they didn't tell us at the time was um, what we later learned that David was young and healthy and he, probably the best chance of survival at that point for that disease was a transplant. So six months later, um, David was in intensive care um, with acute respiratory distress syndrome, the same symptoms that many of the COVID patients were dying with and was given 48 hours to live by the doctors. And he's literally holding onto the side of his bed, hanging on for dear life of his, as his chest, his, his heart is beating out of his chest, 175 beats a minute. And the doctor just said, if it was up to me, I would just let him die. I mean, there's no reason keeping, there's nothing else we can do for him. He's run out of standard of care options. And we didn't know that was even possible. We didn't understand that the doctors actually at a certain point couldn't legally do anything else. And so we had been researching other options that were off-label use of drugs and other therapies that were not approved yet. 
And we asked if we could get, get him one of those trials. And we eventually negotiated the ability to deliver a drug called Milotarg. It was a um, antibody drug conjugate that was not approved yet for David's condition. Um, and it attacked what was called the CD33 protein that was sitting on top of the cancer cell. And so the cancer cell had this protein on it, and this had a little missile that tar targeted that and killed the cell. And, and um, so we got a hold of the inventor, his name was Irv Bernstein, and got him on the phone with the head of oncology at uh, Huntsman Cancer Institute and ended up getting the drug to David. And the next picture I'm going to show you is David 48 hours later. He was not dead. He was sitting up, alert, and he left the hospital the next day. He had a, a complete response to this drug and, and he li lived for another six months, which is very meaningful to everybody and eventually succumbed to the cancer. But one of the things that we learned as part of this process is that um, this a disease is a partnership. Uh, managing the disease is a partnership between the patients and the researchers and the doctors. And that patients have a huge influence on the outcome of the disease. There are things that we learned that there are things that the hospital can't legally do that a patient can do. And that, in fact, if the patient's not involved in, in managing their care, they have worse outcomes. And so we had grown up just thinking we just trusted the doctors. And I'm not saying the doctors are bad in any way. They're amazing. But you have good people in a rigid system. For example, that drug Milotard, it eventually came to market 14 years later, and is now um, being sold by Pfizer as the standard of care for people that have David's exact situation, young patient, AML, refractory to all other treatments, um, salvage therapy with CD33 protein present. It's now the standard of care. We bumped into that by accident 14 years ago, and that story was never shared with anybody. It was lost. And so after David passed away, it just kept um, weighing on me that these stories are being lost every day of important outcomes that are happening. And it takes 17 years on average from a validated hypothesis to enter the delivery system of a hospital. The hospitals are healthcare delivery systems, and many of them are research facilities. They're doing good jobs delivering these, um, these treatments but 80% of the hospitals are actually just delivering them, not inventing them. So we learned a lot through that process. And, um, and it became, became very helpful six years later when Jenny was in that same hospital being diagnosed with another terminal cancer, a blood cancer called multiple myeloma. So we're back talking to the same hospital doctors, having the same conversation. Well, should she try a transplant? or chemotherapy. Uh, we know the answer to this one. Jenny was young and healthy and great looking. Um, and uh, it has nothing to do with it, I guess. <laughs> and she ended up uh, opting for a, a very aggressive therapy. And the data showed this gave her, the, at the time, of all the treatments that were available, and this was 10 years ago, the highest probability of getting a, a complete stringent remission was a tandem transplant. So that's what we did back-to-back -back transplants. And now we were living in Mexico at the time. And so I ended up taking care of the, the munchkins uh, while Jenny um, took care of herself. And we, we figured it out. It was hard. Um, and we had a, a caregiver and support team for Jenny in the United States. And I stayed in Mexico with the kids and, and she did back-to-back -back transplants and she had immune compromise. She was immune compromised for many months and could actually be around the kids. So it was the right answer for us. Um, and so this, um, after Jenny's diagnosis, we realized that more than ever, we're going to have to get involved. So we went to many different groups and identified what the good things that people were doing in this space and identified the holes. And we ended up creating the myeloma crowd to fill in the niches, not replicating what other amazing groups are doing, but to be very entrepreneurial and innovative. We treated Jenny's diagnosis like I would a startup. And my background is a startup investor. I've launched over 150 companies over the last 20 years. And um, some of them you might know, most of them they're 
or failures you wouldn't know, but we did Ancestry.com and, and some very fun companies over the years. And we learned that um, entrepreneurs think differently. And so we identified all these niches and things that weren't being done and then started creating programs to complement the work that was already being done in the space and not compete with it. So on the screen now are some of the programs we've created, including the Myeloma Crowd website, which has over 700,000 unique visitors a year. That's material because that's a, a huge part of the global myeloma population in researchers, patients, and caregivers. Jenny has done 140 radio shows. And I, if you, go, you should go listen to her first show. No. She was shaking and crying. It <laughs> <Sure>. was <laughs> barely made it through. She's a pro now. Um, and, uh, and our Facebook groups are providing support to about 10% of the U.S. myeloma population and many programs like roundtables and research. Um, and these ideas for these programs came, many of them came from our amazing scientific advisory board. Um, and we've been, we've been blessed with being able to be associated with and supported by literally some of the top researchers on the planet. Now, this includes Dr. Irene Gabriel, she's at Dana-Farber, uh, Dr. Faith Davies, who is at NYU, um, Dr. Robert Olowski at MD Anderson Cancer Center, Dr. Ola Landgren at Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, Dr. Guido Trico, who's now back at UAMS, Dr. Gareth Morgan, who's also at NYU, Dr. Nupur Rajay at Mass General, um, Dr. Mike Thompson at Aurora Healthcare, and Dr. Rafael Fonseca at the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale. So once a year, we get to have dinner. Well, we used to have that before the pandemic. <laughs> so we used to have a dinner every year. And then we would ask the doctors this question. What can we do as patients to move the bar towards a cure? What is something that nobody's doing right now that we should be doing? And each year they talk about it and they come out with an idea. And then we go implement that and partner with you to implement these ideas. The Myeloma Crowd Research Initiative came out of that conversation. And Health Tree came out of that conversation. It was came out of a conversation with Dr. Rafael Fonseca of the Mayo Clinic. And Dr. Fonseca said, 80% of patients are being diagnosed by general oncologists. Because that's just how the hospitals play out. A lot of hospitals are delivery hospitals, like my, and, and some are research hospitals. So there's fewer than 20% of the hospitals that do research or clinical styles and trials, and most are just delivery systems. But he said those, the data is showing that those patients that are being treated by the general oncologists are living two years fewer than those that are being treated by a specialist. So if we did nothing else and stop the seminar right here, we'd say, go talk to a specialist. You will live longer, That's true. period, full stop. Now, we were anxious to get this message out. And as we learned this, we realized that we felt we had an obligation to figure out how could, we how could we help the people that were born into different zip codes that were not by a research center and be treated by very good doctors that may not have the, the experience and the history of the complexity of this disease? Because it's a very complex disease. There are many subtypes of genetic mutations that each person has. And so the combinatorial possibilities of this cancer are in the dozens, if not hundreds, for a myeloma patient. And it's very difficult for somebody who's not focused on this full time to understand exactly how to treat this cancer. And so um, we, weren't, we weren't satisfied with just treating. Our, our goal is a cure. And so we, did, we said, can we get the right treatment to the right patients at the right time? And we noticed in the data that some patients were getting 10 years out, 15 years out. Well, those are the types of things that Jenny wanted to know and I wanted to know on day one. What were those patients doing differently than me? Did they have the same type of cancer as me? And we went back and thought about some of the companies we've done over the years and some of the lessons that we've learned. And uh, one of our, my favorite companies that I've um, invested in and I served on the board on for many years was Ancestry.com. And at Ancestry, we learned two important lessons um, that we are able to apply to the cancer world. And I'll talk about those in a bit. So we're going to come back to the ancestry. Um, but before we decided to do it ourselves, we um, tried not to do this. And so we, we went to visit with the IBM Watson team in Austin, Texas, and said, surely you guys have the technology. 
we'll partner with you and said, great, if you help us get the data, then we'll, we'll give you the technology for free. Jenny used to work for IBM. She was a systems engineer. And, um, and so it turned out that IBM did not have the data. And I, this was a wake up call to me. Um, a friend of mine was on the M&A team at Microsoft. We went and talked to the Microsoft Health Fault team. It turns out they didn't have access to the data either and Health Fault wasn't working. Um, I was on the advisory board for Google Launchpad and we talked to people at Google and it turns out they didn't have the data either. And so we realized that it wasn't really a technology problem. It was a, a, a people and a trust problem. So we went on the road. We call this the Summer of Love Tour. Uh, we did a 50 cities to go talk with you and many of you that are on the, on the call today with us and others. We had conversations starting in Salt Lake City, Utah, where we live and ending up in uh, Columbus, Ohio. What was that? And uh, we, we took all the, the kids on a, on a uh, there's all the kids, so you, you can see those. So we took them on the road with us. <laughs> Why, I didn't want to see the family. Um, we took them on the road with us, and oh, they loved it. They, they said, no, we'll gladly give up our summer dad and all our friends, and no, we, 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 we forced them in the suburban, and we drove across the United States. And we visited with, patients and caregivers across the United States and one-on-one and, -on -one and small meetings and listen to these conversations, over 850 conversations. And we eventually understood what would be helpful to you as individuals and patients and caregivers um, to create a system that you trusted. And we got these questions like, who are you? Why are you doing this? And uh, what are you going to do with my data? And so we understood what, that we had to put the patient first Every decision we've made is based on, does this increase trust with the patient? And two, does this move us closer to a cure? We launched Health Tree on October 24th, 2018. And uh, we um, launched a video that um, generated three and a half million views. And then we got a call from the Today Show, uh, which was fun. We went to New York. I wouldn't recommend that today, but back then it was amazing. And uh, doesn't Jenny's hair look great? Look at that. You should watch the video. <laughs> She looks fantastic. Um, she looks great now too, but they had this makeup artist. It was awesome. And, um, and so we ended up having uh, a great experience and we had within a few weeks, we had over 5,000 patients in the system. And so we're going to talk today about how this works. How does health tree work and, and who, and what about your data and how is it stored and, and what's the strategy behind it? So let me give you a little overview and let's jump into the system. First of all, you own your data, period. You own it, it's yours. If you want to share your data with others, we hope you would, and it would help accelerate a cure. But if any time you're not comfortable, you can delete your data out of the system. Of over six or 7,000 patients that are in the system today, we've had less than three people, I don't know, Todd, how many, two or three people that have deleted their data, and uh, we've just done it instantly. So first, and second, the data is, is secure. We follow um, HIPAA level security, and quality and protect your information. It's, your information is not sold. We don't market it. We don't sell the system. You don't. We don't charge people to participate. We don't charge the researchers that are accessing your data. It's a free, open data marketplace where you have this data layer of patients sharing their information. Jenny's information is sitting in eleven different databases. We're able to pull that information into a central location, capture her side effect information her lines of therapy, and then provide benefits back to Jenny and all the people that are using the system. The data is anonymous. Your information is captured, but then it's shared with others on an anonymous basis. The more accurate your data is, the better it is. And so Anna here has a team of dozens of uh, quality individuals that are helping you capture your information, input your records in an accurate way, capturing the, the the lab values from the hospitals, um, the patient records, and uh, I think we're the biggest user of our post office because mm -hmm. we have these cases of, mm -hmm. of records that show up um, to our post office. We, we pull up with the Suburban and mm -hmm. unload them, we scan them in and send them off. Okay, Jenny's giving me the hook here. <laughs> um, so anyway, so Health Tree is for you. We built it for you and for Jenny and all the people that have myeloma, and we've also been asked to do this in many other diseases, and we hope someday to be able to do that also. So here's some of the benefits you get out of it as you enter your information, 
then that we can now provide benefits back to the individual that weren't possible before. I'll just go to the coolest benefit first. My favorite one is your twin machine. And uh, the folks on the Today Show said it was genius. <laughs> Did you hear that? Well, it's what I wanted when I was diagnosed. Exactly what I wanted. I wanted to see everybody that had the same. I had a particular translocation at diagnosis. And um, I wanted to see everybody that looked like me, what they got for treatment, and then how long they lived. Because, you know, the doctors are saying, okay, you have myeloma. It's a disease you've never heard of before. What do you want to do for treatment? We need to start on Friday. And it's a shell shock experience for patients. And how do you make that decision without any data? It was just so maddening. So. so you can see all the people look genetically like you and see the lines of therapy by how long they've been alive since they've had the disease. How long they've been, and how long since, their remissions since, since were and things like that. And all we'll, of their, we'll all of their outcomes. Um, so I think that's, that's a cool one. Another one that's amazing is you get to see all your treatment options in context of your disease. So we've surveyed over 25 of the top specialists in the United States and show them all the possibilities an, an individual can get themselves into for newly diagnosed, relapsed, relapsed refractory, and then show you all the treatment options. The next is clinical trials. We can show you all the clinical trials that exist, 450 clinical trials, but not just those. We show them the ones you, quali you qualify for and then help you get into those trials. And again, it's free. Nobody's paid to get you into the trial, by the way. Um, and then as you capture that information, we have, we have an amazing reporting engine that can give you feedback and information, and we also connect with researchers. And so the researchers are accessing this information and they're putting surveys out there. So we can pulse very quickly. There's a survey on there that talked about um, um, a question this doctor is planning to spend two years on, we were able to get it up in the system, get 550 patients to answer the system within two weeks. And we save that doctor, a researcher, a quarter million dollars, and we, did, we answer the question in two weeks. So that's the power of the patient community and what we can do to pulse faster and accelerate research. All right, so that's, I can go on and on. Health <laughs> University is amazing, 650 videos, but why don't we just um, answer some questions here? and then get into, um, we'll answer some questions live, and then we'll get into a demo. How about that? Yeah, well, Gail had a good question. Well, I, I wanna address Gail's question, um, and you're welcome, you'll see a little Q&A section. Uh, we're gonna go through this section by section. So, uh, Gail, I'm gonna wait to address your question um, when we get a little bit further in, but um, let me go ahead and share, show you, just jump into the health tree um, side of it. Okay, I'm going to be showing you two different things. Want to answer Gil's question? Um, yes, but it taught we, yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, I actually would like to pull your question, Gil, till, um, I think it's a good question, later. Gil. We're going to ask you in a second. <laughs> Everybody's going to have a similar question. <laughs> yes, it's true. Okay. Um, well, it, it kind of talks about the consent. I want to explain it a little bit more. Okay. So if you create an account, which you probably have already had. So my death, my, my part? Um, yes, you can jump into the rest too. Okay. <laughs> um, you can create an account if you're a myeloma patient, if you're a caregiver who has access to information, or if you have a different diagnosis, um, we basically say, yeah, we'll check with you later um, because we have been requested to build health tree for over 50 diseases. Uh, but we're trying to get myeloma right um, because we are totally focused on myeloma. So if you say, um, yes, I'm a myeloma patient, and we're going to add some information. And you'll basically create an account. While Jenny's filling that out, I just want to jump in. We've had a few questions from international patients asking if Health Tree is of a benefit for 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 them if you know if you're not in the United States. And so, as Jenny's going over this demo, you'll see lots of features in Health Tree that will benefit you no matter where you live. Um, keep in mind the treatment options we show and the clinical trials we show are U.S. based, but all the other functionality in there will help you um, internationally as you go through your um, 
you know, you're trying to understand your options and the conversations you have with doctors. Mm -hmm. Okay, great point. Thanks, Todd, for addressing that. So when you create an account, you'll see Paul again, and you'll see a video um, of patients talking about their experience. I think we're all very similar. It's usually a diagnosis we'd never heard of before. And it's all, it, we were just frustrated that every single patient seems to have to reinvent the wheel. And, but you can watch that on your own. Um, once you say get started, if you have a brand new account, you will see something that looks like this. So you will see a profile that needs to be completed. And this is the section that we're going to be talking about today. So you can, you can create it in here. You can edit if it's been created. So I can go in and add a profile picture. I can add my treatment goals. I can edit my account information or my personal information. As you fill these sections out, you'll see, like let's say I started out with in January of 2012 or so, let's say I started out with smoldering myeloma. And then I have IgG kappa myeloma. I can search on different facilities. We have a lot of facilities already in there that are pre-populated. Um, or we'll add your facility that's not already in there. And then you can add another diagnosis. Let's say in 2015, I, my, I progressed to active myeloma and now I can add my active myeloma diagnosis. But maybe let's say um, I was at a different facility when I got my second diagnosis. And then you can see it'll check that off and I completed my diagnosis information. Um, on the myeloma team, it'll also, you can just keep going down through this and um, this is actually my doctor. Or let's say I have a doctor and I don't wanna add any other physicians. And then you can say, if there's a family or a friend uh, or other member assisting you with your cancer care, I'm gonna say no on this. But that does help us if um, just follow up if something happens to you and we just use it for emergency purposes. We also ask if a coach, a myeloma coach, helped you use Health Tree. And if you did, um, yes, we can say that Beth Travis helped me fill out my profile. The myeloma coaches are available to help you fill out your profile. And then you'll see how it continues. Um, your health and fitness status, um, we'll, we'll go through each of these individual um, things, but now I wanna jump, um, actually I'm gonna jump down here to this, well, I'll just go in order, I guess. Um, on the health and fitness, we invite you to share health, your current health and fitness conditions. These are conditions that would preclude a specific myeloma therapy. Um, and so it's not a full set of conditions, if that makes sense, but it's things that would affect your use of um, dexamethasone or Velcade or other types of conditions. So we ask you to do those. I'm actually gonna jump to a profile that's been completed. So you can see what it looks like once you've finished, once you've finished the section, um, you'll be able to see the, um, the full profile. So that will look like this when you've completed these sections. And as you complete those sections, you'll see things, you'll see the tiles turn from blue, from gray to blue. So they're activated and you have full access to that section. So this is the way that it looks in this other section. Under the diagnosis, you can see now that I have these two sections or these two diagnoses. You can see my treatments, I mean my physicians, and you can see my, I can complete my, let's say no, I don't have any heart conditions, I don't need bone conditions, kidney, maybe I have diabetes, and I'm pre-diabetic, maybe I have high blood pressure but it's under control, I don't have any blood clots. I already have a little bit of mild neuropathy and I don't have any other health conditions. 
We also ask about your fitness status. Fitness status matters in myeloma. So the myeloma doctors are breaking us into categories of fit, unfit, and frail patients. They do this a lot of times to identify if, um, if, if a patient is um, able to get a stem cell transplant or not. So that helps. So I can assess my fitness status. And if I keep saying no, it'll keep asking me questions. And then it'll ask me if I've ever been told I cannot get a stem cell transplant. And then it asks, what the status is of your current myeloma? Some of the logic that's built into the system behind the scenes is whether you're having a clinical relapse um, with like bone damage or what they call crab criteria, or if you're having what's called a biochemical relapse, which is your numbers might be going up, but there's no new bone damage or no cal you know, high calcium or no um, anemia, no, you know, those, no extra bone lesions, things like that. So those, that question is related to that. So let's say my myeloma is controlled and I can keep going on that. So I want to stop at that point and just see, um, okay, I'm just we're, reviewing we're some gonna answer, questions We're going to answer here. a few questions here. Yeah. Okay, Heather has a good question. She says her kappa light chains are the ones that are out of whack. Does that mean her myeloma type is kappa? So um, Heather, that's a good question. You can have, just to explain, there's a heavy and a light chain. So you'll have usually high, um, kappa or lambda myeloma, and then you'll have like IgM or IgG or IgA. And those two together are the heavy and the light chain together. So if your kappa light chain is the one that is out of whack, you most likely have kappa type myeloma. So there'll be another chain that's related to that. So And, and there's a great class on Health Tree University mm -hmm. that explains the difference between um, kappa and lambda myeloma and what that means. And, and, uh, and so, and you can take a quiz afterwards, by the way. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna address Mark's question about genetics in the next section. Um, but also for Leslie, she said, are there myeloma specialists that see my records to give their opinion on treatment? I have a great doc, but want a specialist to give opinions. Um, we're in the process of working on that right now, Leslie, because this is a perfect platform to be able to um, use for a second opinion. And in some of these, I, we'll go back and show you where you can print out your, your information as well. So the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. You can get a, an opinion from a specialist and then have your um, general oncologist um, work with your specialist to deliver um, your treatments. And many people do that and that works. So I believe that, and, and sometimes you just don't, you don't have the, you're not close to a specialist, but there are many specialists that would just love to give you advice and guidance and work with your doctor and this, they collaborate all the time. So that's a great question. It is a great question. Okay, does anybody have any questions on either the diagnosis the myeloma team or the current health and fitness sections. I think we should go just section by section because once we jump into the um, genetic section, it's pretty um, more detailed. <laughs> Any questions on that? Does that or does does that make sense? Okay, this is what it looks like once you've finished the section. You can go in and edit it and click on it. Let's talk about the treatments. So for this individual, um, we have, let's say we started out with RVD for induction therapy. Just minimize that for a second. Yeah. They, they don't see that. Okay. So um, let's say we started out with Rev Velcadex. You can enter in your, um, you, I'll show you how to add, but you can also enter in your side effects. So this individual had RVD and then they had um, melphalanus stem cell transplant. And then they had, then they relapsed. And so they tried, RVD worked for a while with the stem cell transplant, but then they added Darzelex to it. And then they potentially included a clinical trial. When you add treatment, you can go in and add your treatment. If you're adding treatment, um, if you have had a stem cell transplant that includes induction therapy, you want to select that option. 
if you started out with therapy that's not necessarily planning to go to a transplant, but you ended up doing a transplant later, you should include it right here under chemotherapy or myeloma therapy. So let me just give you an example of how you would do that. You could say stem cell transplant. Okay, I had an autologous stem cell transplant. And what does autologous mean? Autologous is when you use your own stem cells and an allogeneic transplant is when you use donor cells. So yes, I can say, let's say I collected my stem cells in January of um, this year. And it asks me, most cases, in, in most cases, the doctors will provide you with something they call induction therapy. That's basically therapy that will prepare you to get a stem cell transplant with a planned stem cell transplant after that. So you can say, yes, I got induction therapy and I started it in January of this year and I'm not currently on it. And it went for three months until this year and I used Revlimid and Velcade and dexamethasone, or let's say I used Kyprolis in this instance, if I had a second transplant. And then it'll show your, your therapies. And then sometimes your doctor will add or remove a drug, but I'm gonna say, nope, that was it. What was my best response? Well, maybe I didn't know, or I can say my myeloma is now undetectable, or it reduced it and let's say it reduced my myeloma and kept it under control. Here's where you're able to add side effects. We are updating the section so it might look a little bit different um, in a, about a month. But let's say I had a decreased appetite. I can slide this here and say how bad was it? Not very bad or really, really bad. And I can gauge it that way. And then I continue. Wait, wait, wait. Are you on dexamethasone? Um, well, I'll go in and add that later. Because okay. <laughs> cause where, where's the like side effect where everybody else is stupid? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one for <laughs> Dexamethasone. Right. Um, the day you started your stem cell transplant, so let's say I started my transplant in March when I was, or April when I was finished with my induction therapy of this year. And I can say, yes, I know the dose of melphalan, the most common dose is 200 milligrams, but you can ask your doctor and you can say, I don't know if you don't know. And then you can say, and now my myeloma is undetectable and I had a complete response to my treatment. And then I can say, okay, well, it was really bad. Um, let's say I was really bad here for my stem cell transplant. And you can see there are a lot of side effects that you can include. And then you click continue and then um, it saves. This side effect information is not just helpful to you, it's now helpful to others as they're trying to understand the impact of taking these different treatments. And, um, and this is really the only place where this information is captured. It's not captured in the hospital records um, and the information is now openly available to other patients. And so this is an amazing service that you can provide and leverage from, to others and others can provide to you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So now you can see that I entered this new um, RevDex um, Kyprolis and I had my stem cell collection and I had my stem cell transplant, but I can go in and delete this too if I want to delete it or start over or whatever. So you can edit all of this. And I'm gonna, let's say I'm gonna delete my clinical trial as well. Okay, any questions? on I'm not sure where my Q&A went so. oh, questions right there any questions about this section about how to add the information yeah Heather noted that her doctor tells her her side effects are not cancer related so it's, it'll be nice to have a way to compare what others are experiencing I would strongly suggest that you fill out the side effects because we are working on something that you're going to love <laughs> and um, you'll be able to compare side effects. So I won't talk a lot about that, but um, you're going to want to have that in your profile so you can compare. So, and let's answer two mm -hmm. questions here. 
Okay. Um, so that's Heather's question. Yes, it will be great to compare. Um, okay. well, there's a lot of questions on side effects. So just keep in mind what Jenny said is that we're, we're working on something to help you with that. Um, um, but yeah, there's quite a few questions coming in about side effects. Okay, and um, Heather, yes, you can track side effects through maintenance therapy. So yes, um, you'll when we, you say add treatment, if you have a treatment also, you can say um, chemotherapy. And I didn't go all the way through the stem cell tra transplant process, but it does ask you if you want to add your maintenance therapy. So let's say I started in May. Sorry, I have to move this down a little bit. Let's say I'm still on maintenance therapy, and yes, it's a maintenance therapy. It would be better if you note it as maintenance therapy because we're separating induction therapy from regular chemotherapy and transplant. And so we're defining those three as three separate things. So let's say I'm, let's say I'm on Pomalist for my maintenance therapy, and I can add it there. Uh -huh. And no, no treatment changes were made. And um, let's say I'm currently on the treatment and my response is unknown. And I can say, well, I have a side effect. Um, that's how you would do it on, you know, that's how you would do it. Sometimes doctors don't know the side effects because you patients lie to them. And we found that a lot of patients just aren't sharing side effect information with their doctors. Either you run out of time in the clinic and you don't want to talk about them, or you're afraid that if you tell the doctor about the side effect, they'll take you off the therapy. So this is a place you can be honest about it, and the doctor's eyes are wide open. They're saying, we've never seen this information before because patients just haven't shared it. Mm -hmm. So this really helps the doctors also then be better communicators to patients about what, what the side effects truly are about the disease. Yeah, um, Grant had a good question. He says, if you enter information from memory that you later discover was incorrect, can you edit or update? And yes, and um, part of this is why we ask for the consent as part of the process. So let's talk a little bit about that because there were some questions about the medical records consent process. So in order to provide accurate reporting, um, proper treatment options for you, clinical trials that you're eligible to join, it's really, really imperative that this data is accurate because otherwise we're sharing data that's not necessarily correct and that doesn't help anybody. So we um, invite you to, we have a video here that describes it, but we have um, a way to have you provide medical records consent for either one, your paper record or your online portal. Some patients give us access to both. Some give us access to one or the other uh, of their preference. And some of the questions were, were in there. Um, what we do in that process, let, let me explain the process that we go through to do that. When someone joins Health Tree, we invite you to sign that consent. You sign the consent online and you can add it for all of your hospitals. Like I have my records at four different hospitals. So I have signed consent for four different hospitals. Um, we make the request to the hospital for the paper record. The paper record comes back to us and then we work with you to enter your prior lines of therapy accurately, as well as some of your genetic features, because sometimes that can be very confusing. You can enter it in. It is very helpful for our team. If you take a first pass at your prior lines of therapy, we've had some patients who are um, keep very good track of what they had and when, and some haven't had very much therapy, so it's really easy to remember. And sometimes you had therapy 15 years ago, so it's harder to remember when you came on and off and what you did, uh, what we found is sometimes we triangulate with information. So we use the paper chart and we use the patient and we use the online portal. Um, so some of the questions, yeah, so Karen, your question was, can we use approximate information? Yes, we will go through a validation process with you. And when you wanna use certain features like this COVID study that we are running currently, we have over 1,038 patients who have joined the study and have gone through this validation process. So what we're doing with each individual in that study is saying, we'll call you, Anna's team will call you, 
and we'll say, okay, let's set up 10 minutes to go over your platform, your um, information in your portal. Um, you had RevDex and then you had a stem cell transplant on this day and it looks like your genetics are this and then they changed to this. And then we'll mark you as val a validated profile on the back end. So in the future, when you wanna take advantage of additional health tree benefits, like what we were mentioning about second opinions or things like that, the doctor will have everything all ready to go and you'll be all set. All right, so, and so we have-, um, it, we have Michelle had another question that's, um, that's great. How do I indicate where additional drugs are added to a treatment regimen? So we, we asked that question when you're adding the treatments did the doctor make a change? Did they add a drug or delete a drug? And um, you can just click yes, they made a change. Did they increase your dose or decrease your dose? Because the doctors do that all the time in myeloma. They'll start out with, let's say, a triplet regimen, and then they'll take off one drug or lower the dose of one drug, or they'll add another drug. So you can add it, um, you add it in date order if possible. Um, it'll organize it in date order for you. So actually, if you want to go backwards and, and in terms of what you remember and then go backwards, um, you can, if it's a completely new therapy, like let's say, for example, you started RevDex Velcade and they dropped the Revlimid. That, you would edit that to say, yes, I dropped something out of that treatment combination. If you want to, um, and then they would start a whole new treatment combination and you can enter that separately. But that's some of the stuff that our staff can help you with if you have specific questions about how to do it. But yes, you can add or change. Um, you can add up to one thing and, and decrease up to one thing and delete up to one thing and then um, add it that way. Okay, um, how do you, I saw one question, let's see. Yeah, Natalie asks, how often should we update the treatment every time there's a small change? Um, I think it'd be very helpful for people who are um, looking at other profiles. Yes, keep it updated. And we'll help you go through that validation process. So when, when we first started this, a lot of the researchers and doctors were skeptical. They said to us, garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and But what we found is that get started, start improving it, and, um, and uh, it's like uh, doing genealogy. Just start with what you know, and then you'll find research, and over time, you'll be able to create, to, to create a deeper and more accurate profile. And then Anna and her team are here to help us um, fill this information out, get the accurate lab values, and get the information in there. There was a question on the lab values. Um, yeah, let's go to the lab values. That was was used here, where was the one? He said, what, what is the, um, the ratios that you're using on the lab values? Are you using one ten thousandths or one hundred thousandths for detection? And um, we had this interesting experience a few weeks ago where Jenny um, got her labs back and her cancer had grown 10x since the last diagnosis. So of course I freaked out. <laughs> so we had a you know a few days of, of tears and pity party, and it turns out that the hospital that we've been going to for 10 years changed how they're recording the lab values overnight without telling the patients and freaked everybody out. And so the it so it depends on the hospital itself. Jenny can answer that maybe better, but this is this is yeah. a question from Mike Touche. Yeah, the question is a great one, Mike, and it depends is the answer. So Let's go into the myeloma labs section because I want to show you how this works. Every facility, essentially, Mike and maybe Todd, you want to talk about this a little bit, but every facility measures certain lab values differently. So um, do you want to share about how we do that on the back end, Todd? Uh, yeah, so we'll try to normalize it on this system, mm -hmm. by the way. So we'll try to put a normalization across yes. here. Mm -hmm. And so the answer is it depends on the labs, but we're going to provide a normalization view on the system. Right. It should normalize it on the system. But yeah, every hospital reports different lab value measurements. Um, and we try to provide those in the drop down menus as you're adding your labs so you can select the one, you know, that your hospital uses. Um, <clears throat> there are many. 
So not all of them are in there. I think we've had a few questions from international patients asking about that, that their measurement values aren't represented in what we have. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, you can message us and, and we will take a look at that and add them in if possible. We are always researching that and adding in new ones that we find so that they're available for you. Mm -hmm. Let me go over this a little bit. So there are several ways to get your labs in. You can add labs manually and that will just say, okay, what was your lab date? And what were your myeloma markers? This is what Todd's talking about, where you can select the measurement that your facility uses. So let's say my lab value is six, and maybe I didn't get it run on the protein. You can see the different lab values. These are your myeloma markers. So these, there was one question about what lab values are you watching to detect the cancer? And these are the myeloma markers that you want to track the most. So it's how many, what percentage of your cells in your bone marrow are plasma cells. The normal is like 1%. So I think they consider anything over 5% is active myeloma. Um, so that's what you're going to enter in there. Um, you'll enter in also your kappa number and your lambda number and your ratio. Those numbers are tracked um, very regularly by your doctor, as is your M protein number. This is also called your monoclonal protein, your M spike, your M protein. It has three names. It's all the same thing. And that one number you want to check very carefully. We also allow you to enter your MRD test number. So um, MRD testing is kind of a newer lab value that people are starting to track. There are Several, there are two different types. One is called flow cytometry, and the other one is called next generation sequencing. You may be familiar with the adaptive test or have heard of that, and that's um, a next generation sequencing sound. It will tell you how many cells were found per, per million, per 100,000, and they'll show things like 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus six, and things like that. So if you have an iPhone, or if your child or grandchild has an iPhone, or if you have a spare one, um, you can use an app called Health Tree Connect. And that will, and you can look up your hospital, integrate your hospital, and all those lab values we uploaded into the system, and you don't have to do it. Um, another way to do it is to click the record, um, upload your records, and Anna and her team will upload the lab values. So. You can do it yourself. You can integrate, um, connect with your hospital through the Health Tree Connect app in the App Store. Even if you don't, if you have an Android, just I'm sure you got an old iPhone. Somebody's got an old iPhone laying around the house. Connect through the App Store and do that, or you can get your records. So, but it's important that we get, we get accurate lab values, and so get them in, and then and then keep them updated over the time, and then you can see. Um, go back to your your views your view screen, Jenny, of the, the labs. All right, so as you look down, and you can see the, um, the lines of therapy, and you can see now, start seeing the trends of the lab values and, and how they, they trend over time. And then down below, and you can see your complete blood counts, your, your information at diagnosis, and then your actual, actual labs are, are down here. So, um, and so you've got the ability to then you know, see the data, and this is important. Um, now, for the, for the researchers and doctors, you can go, go ahead, Jenny. Okay, so Mark had a Wait question. Okay, well, I think we're going to go over, <laughs> if that's okay with everybody. And we can continue because there's so much left to, to um, talk about, and we haven't even gotten to genetics yet. So we're going to continue, um, if you don't mind. Let, let's let's jump through a bunch of up. questions. So Mark had a question. He said, what's the status on the tool to import medical record data? And that's, the, that's what Paul just mentioned. I think we should have a separate webinar on how that product works, but we have a PDF that shows you step-by-step step exactly what to click on. Your hospital, it does work on an iPhone, and your hospital has to be included in Apple Health. Can we show them where the PDF is in the system? Um, no, we have to email it to them. Oh, so. okay, Todd will email it to you. And we are gonna be posting it on the website, so you'll be able to download it easily. Yeah. Um, Gail, your question is, will you eventually have the app on Android the answer is no, because Apple is the one who connected with the hospitals at the hospital level. However, 
most hospitals are working on it, newer, what they call interoperability rules and greater access through something called a FHIR API. F-H-I-R. And when the hospitals open up that portal to us as a development shop, then we will be able to go in regardless of um, the platform that your phone is on and go grab those records from your hospital and automatically upload them into your portal. For now, it's just on Apple Health, but in the future, we do see that. And the reason Apple Health, that we do it through Apple Health right now is because they're accessing your records via secure portal. They encrypt the records, they drop them onto your phone encrypted, and then they give us permission to take those encrypted records and upload it into the cloud in a secure cloud. So your records are never on the Apple server ever. They're just on your phone in a secure format. And so they've given us access and permission through the Apple Health Kit API to do that. And, and so and Android just doesn't have that capability. So we're sorry about that. But you now have over 4,000 hospitals that are in the Apple Health app that you can select your hospital, give it access, and then download the app and connect the two and upload it. It sounds like a, little, a lot of work, but it's a lot faster than typing in yourself. Mm -hmm. And Charles, um, you had a question on the download with the Apple app, and um, I, I will turn that one over to Todd and Anna to follow up with you. Uh, so Todd, if you'll type in directly to um, to, to, Char Charles, to yeah. Charles, and he'll and yeah. get contact yeah. information on a private thread. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. We'll give you direct support on that. And then Amy, your doctor asked you if you is said you couldn't do an MRD test because they didn't have an initial baseline. Um, that's for the NGS test for the adaptive test. They wanted an initial baseline. You can see if you had a sample from prior that, that they can go test. I actually had that done, but um, there are also different types of, um, the flow cytometry doesn't require that. So anyway, you, that's a question. Okay, um, William, you had a question on information about where to find more information on neuropathy. We're actually creating a Heltry University class on side effects. And neuropathy will be a huge class because a lot of myeloma patients have it, whether that's because of the myeloma itself or whether it's because of um, the treatment itself. Okay. Um, let's see. I want to continue to genetics just so I make sure. You never answered Gil's answer. Oh, question. okay, Gil. So your question was about actually um, providing consent for the online portal. You don't have to provide consent for the online portal. You can provide consent just for the paper chart. So that's an option. You have either or. Some people like um, having us um, access their portal so we can, sometimes we can do the, um, the automatic upload for you without you needing the iPhone app. So if that's the case, then we would need that. But to validate your profile, you don't have to sign that. All right, so. and, then, and then you have a question around your password. So come up with a new password. Don't give us an old password, but you can, you can just call it, call it password or some simple word, but we, we don't want access to your personal information or your monetary information in any way. So this is just for the health information on the website. I think she's talking about the portal consent. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And so, and Todd, if you could add, follow up with Gail directly in that message and answer any more questions directly with her, I think that might be helpful. And Constance, um, you had a question about how can, if you can mark stem cells. Actually, we only have the ability right now to mark when you did the collection um, it, in relationship to the, the stem cell transplant. So we'll have to, that's a good note for Todd to, to um, add just stem cell collection in general. So there's a couple of questions around working with the other foundations. And so our answer is yes, we're open and excited to work with anybody that'd love to work with us. Are, we're going to be putting all of our information into um, what we call a data trust. And so for any organization that wants access to the de-identified information for research purposes, they can connect and participate in the data trust like all the researchers are. And then we can collaborate and research around the patient information. And so that's free. It's no charge. Um, and, um, and we found this, this, uh, this hospital and research world's kind of strange. They don't like sharing data, <laughs> uh, but we patients want to get it out there. So we want to get it out there in a safe, uh, de-identified way. And the answer is yes. Has anybody ever shared data with me? The answer is no, uh, but we will share data with everybody else. Mm -hmm. Amy had a question on authorization too, to get her labs from the portal, but she doesn't see them in her profile yet. 
So Amy, that's a process for the team and Anna will follow up with you on that one. I wanna go over myeloma genetics because this is really- There was a question that was disappeared on there. Could you answer that one from Mary? Oh, so Mary asked, if I consent to my health records, does my new lab result automatically update in health tree? Um, no, it doesn't. So we'll go in and enter everything that you had prior. Um, we can run the Apple Health Connect for you to keep them updated on a standard basis. It is something that it would be helpful for you to just go in. I've noticed that I always used to go ask my doctor for a printout after every visit and it's not as hard to keep it updated, but we can do it in bulk if it's on Apple Health. Um, and then you can also do it manually or you can request that, um, uh, make a special request to our team. Um, we, we didn't start out entering all the labs for everyone because our team is, um, you know, we're, we're still a small team. <laughs> yeah, just so you know, it costs us about $180 per patient to enter your lab information for you. And so we've gotten generous um, donations from patients and, and different groups and companies have given us donations to cover those costs. So we're a nonprofit foundation. Um, the, the team is working hard to help patients, but there is an overhead for to pull all that information in together and get it there. I'm trying, we're trying to bring the costs down, but, um, the more you can do, the more you can bring the cost down. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. It would be great. Okay, genetics. Um, so a certain percentage of myeloma patients have genetic features. And what does that mean? It's not your personal genetics, like on a 23andMe test or something like that. These are the genetic features of your multiple myeloma cells. So the doctor usually will use a bone marrow biopsy to determine those, and they will do a draw, and then they will send it off. And there are three kinds of, um, I'm gonna add some test results here. So there are the FISH test results, which is the most common test that's done across pretty much all facilities. Um, the cytogenetics is a more broad term for genetic testing for myeloma. Um, they're, more, they're less specific, that's kind of the umbrella term for genetic features in myeloma. And then you have a gene expression profile test uh, and then you have something called the next generation sequencing test. The next generation sequencing test is the most advanced and mostly used only in clinical trials at this point. But Foundation Medicine is one of the providers of those types of tests. So you'll pick your test type and you'll pick the day um, when you have the test. Um, there is something called gene additions where you have extra chromosomes. There's something called gene deletions when you have one or both of your chromosomes are missing on those myeloma cells, or you have a translocation where it's some of the genes have swapped places. And I'll show you a little bit more um, about that. But usually on your test, they will show you, let, like let's say I have a gain of one Q. It should tell you on your FISH test, not all tests have it, but um, the percentage of cells. And that's important because if you have a high risk feature and you have a low percentage of cells, it's not as high risk as having a high risk feature with a high percentage of cells. So the percentage of cells is something that you wanna track, if possible. Additionally, the genetics of your disease might change over time. Sometimes you can start out with certain genetics features and then they can change over time. So it's something that you wanna track and just ask your doctor, do you have a copy of my fish test? I want to look at my genetics. You may or may not have any genetic features, and we have a way of also saying, no, I don't have any separate genetic features. Now, some of you might be looking at this and saying, this is hard. I don't know if I can do this. Mm -hmm. Listen, we, we, we knew nothing about anything. <laughs> we were just patients and caregivers. So you guys can do this. Um, and we, we've got a, a team of volunteers that are ready to help you and support you. And we have a hundred, over a hundred myeloma coaches that are in the trenches with you. And these are other patients and caregivers that are there to help you also and answer questions. And so the answer is, this is totally doable. I know it seems complex in science, but over time it just gets easier and it becomes a new language. You just have like learning a new language. Well, what it means is that you understand what kind of myeloma you have, because not all myeloma patients are the same. There are eight or nine different genetic 
variations of myeloma and sometimes people have them in combination. So when you're looking at the reports and the twin feature, you wanna be looking at patients that look more like you. I remember when I first started um, going to Huntsman, you know, some of the nurses would say, you know, some of the patients are wondering why somebody has such a great outcome and why I'm struggling so much. Um, it's because no one's myeloma is the same. So we want to find people that are most like us. And we have some explanation here too that might be helpful to you. So let's say you have a gene deletion of, of 13 or you have um, one of your chromosomes is missing. You can read up a little bit about that. And you can also, like, what does that actually mean to me? So here's normal chromosomes, and this is what a deletion means. You can do the same thing for the translocation. What is a translocation? Well, it's kind of when these two chromosomes that should look like this really have swapped places on pieces. And there's a video to explain every bit of information in here, explained by the top 75 of the top researchers in the world in great detail with videos. And, and uh, the team has done a great job at Health Tree University. So if you're confused about that, there's a, a detailed video on each one of these. Mm -hmm. Okay, does anybody have genetics questions? Um, before we move on, I want to address the full health profile and then show you what you can do once some of this is. Okay, Vicki has a question. She, she said, I'd really like the way for, to see final outcomes. So since this disease is not curable, um, it'd be helpful to know when patients pass away and what they died of, kidney failure, heart failure, um, or a complication. Uh, they're probably a complication of myeloma. So Vicki, this is something that we can add in Health Tree. I think this would be helpful. We do have um, a date that, and we do maintain information on patients who have died. So we can ask this as a follow-up. Can I answer Shauna's question? Yeah, sure. So Shauna Bolanos has a great question. I love this question. We got it on the Today Show, which is, um, ha has, the, has the question of HIPAA protection or patient information been discussed? If I have my health information, am I guaranteed privacy? And uh, so many of you don't know, because I didn't know this, the P in HIPAA stands for portability, Health Information Portability Act. It's only one P, by the way, H-I-P-A-A. -A. And, and it was intended to help data connect, but it had all these unintended consequences because there's a twenty-five dollars to $50,000 fine for sharing, accidentally um, leaking HIPAA information. So... What happened was the unintended consequences, all of our information got locked down. And now during the COVID crisis, the government has eliminated the fines for HIPAA violations because there's such a need to share data right now. And so what you're signing is a privacy consent form that yes, um, protects your privacy. And, uh, and so you can, it's, it's very detailed and it's, thought, it's well thought through. So there's a, there's a privacy document that you will sign. Um, now you, you can share your information inside of this data trust with other patients and researchers to accelerate a cure. And we can um, uh, you know, eliminate some of these silos that have existed as prevented us from accelerating a cure. So uh, HIPAA was a good idea that had unintended consequences and it went off the rails and it actually has hurt more people than helped. But we have think we've addressed it with our, our privacy policy. Great question, thank you. And Daniel, thank you for your question. He was wondering how he can donate to Health Tree and can he use his credit card? So on the Myeloma Crowd website, there's a donate button and you can donate there because that's going to this COVID study in the Health Tree platform right now. So, and when and when you donate, you so we don't, I don't normally ask for donations. Well, we actually never do. Yeah, um, <laughs> we don't. But just so you know, we never talk about this, but we should probably should. 100% of your donations go towards research. There is no overhead taken out of individual donations, zero, not to rent or salaries, it goes towards research. Um, and the way we can do that is we get corporate sponsors to cover the overhead of the foundation and, um, and, uh, and some other things that we do to generate the revenue, but the donations, 100% uh, would go directly towards research with not a penny taken out. And that's pretty unique about us. Um, and, uh, and so, it's great. We're grateful for that. And the researchers love it. And we're able to push more research and get stuff done. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Um, Constance also had a question about, do you track diet and supplement information? This would be a huge part of outcome in cancer. Yes. That's one of the reasons we created Health Tree because it's it very easy for us as patients to vet out certain things like, does curcumin work in myeloma? That's a big question, right? So um, you'll see, let me go over one more. And, and there are many things that patients are doing that are generating outcomes that you would never put into a clinical trial because there's no money in it. But mm -hmm. wouldn't it, so a lot of the stuff and the research we can do in, the, in this platform is to do these observational clinical trials. And we have many of them going right now and just seeing what's going on and if, it, if they're helpful. Was, wouldn't it be sad if there was a cure out there that was free, but nobody wanted to invest into it because there's no money in it? Well, we'd be able to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's another section in the Track My Myeloma section that's really, really important for our collective reports. So, by the way, Natalie, so, yes, there's a video of this. It'll be available for Natalie Boosley. And so the whole information will be available online with a video afterwards. Um, good luck at work. Mm -hmm. She, yeah, and Karen, you can enter your deletion um, of P50 or your 17 deletion in there, um, in the genetic section. If you need help doing that, we can help you. So I wanna show you this full health profile because a lot of the reports we're generating that are the anonymous reports are generated from this section. So um, this includes things like your myeloma family history. I mean, wouldn't it be an interesting question to see how many patients like how many patients are having bone disease and how severe is it? Um, how about our kidney failure issues? Do, we, do people have allergies or other autoimmune disorders? Um, this section actually led us to run a whole study of psoriasis patients and myeloma. And we just completed that study just recently. But what's the relationship between cancer and in families and myeloma? And what's the relationship with um, family history. We actually have reports in the report section that have answers to these. But here's some of the things that we're asking about lifestyle and diet. And we've been talking to actually two other investigators, one at Mass General and one at Roswell Park, and they want to run a fitness study. And so we could do a diet and fitness study inside of Health Tree, and we could even divide up by, you know, what kind of diet are you using? Are you using the keto diet or are you using um, intermittent fasting or or what kind of diet are you using and is it having an actual impact on your myeloma? Those, those are the types of studies that are not going to be run by the, the traditional research community because like Paul said, there's no money to fund it, but we have a platform where we can add, answer those questions collectively as patients. Now, I, the Constance has a great question around data privacy and the top questions when we got on the road were, who are you? <laughs> Why are you doing this and what are you going to do with my data? And, uh, and hopefully you understand who we are and why we're doing this. And, and we answer what we do with the data. But one of the questions around she asked is, there's been a lot of high visibility data breaches in the news. How can you be confident that our data is safe with you? So I asked the question, what are hackers going to do with, um, with, uh, health data. Are they going to cure us? If so, we should publish it openly in the, on the internet. Um, now, most of the information on here, we don't, have we don't have financial information. We don't have credit card information on you. And so we do protect your data. It is encrypted. Um, what if there was a data breach? Well, um, the answer is, I hope they use it and cure us. That would be my answer. But we haven't had one to date. Uh, we don't anticipate we have one. We have um, testing going on all the time to keep it secure. One question was, what are you going to do with our data ongoing? Well, it's your data. It's not ours. So you can delete it at any time. And if you don't want it in there, just delete the data. We hope you wouldn't, but it's your, it's your data. So it's, you have that mm -hmm. choice. But you've done a lot of work to keep it in there. And uh, we're doing a lot to keep your trust. And um, one thing that I want to note is after you finish this section, we do have all these different benefits that you can get out of it. So for example, and we'll have a whole webinar on this, but this is, you can see, you can see treatment options. Let's scroll up. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, you can see treatment options and we'll go into more detail, but these are specific treatment options based on your genetics, your lab values, your level of relapse. Um, it's very specific to you. So, so, so for example, Jenny, there's 11, expert preferred treatment options that are ranked for Jenny um, based on how the, 
what the experts would do for her in her current situation. And she can learn more about those treatment options and there's videos on them and um, explanation, links to research. And this gives Jenny a kind of a sense for how to have that conversation with her doctor. And these are customized. Um, same thing for clinical trials. Well, that'll be a whole separate class, so we won't go into it. But Heltree University, um, you can do that right now. And you can see um, all these classes have been created. Um, this is content that you can use today. And you can watch videos. You can take notes. You can bookmark the important classes. You can take a quiz when you're finished. And you um, get points for taking the classes. Mm -hmm, yeah. And there'll be a nice, fun prizes. So what is multiple myeloma? Multiple myeloma is a blood disorder that uh, is thought to originate from plasma cells. This these classes are taught from the top 75 leading experts in the world on myeloma, and they break it down into understandable uh, language and videos and graphs and terms that we can understand. Let me also show you just one thing about the reports, just so you have an idea of how they are run against what you've entered. So for example, um, people ask, oh, is my personal information gonna be shared? These are the types of reports that we're generating. So you can't tell who anybody is in any section. We just see the total that here's the percentage of patients who have joined Health Tree, and here's the age distribution. And I'm just so proud of um, our community, our myeloma community, that they're not afraid of tech to be able to use a system like this. So it's just fantastic. So these are, you can go to the report section. Um, once you enter in your information, they're automatically updated and you'll see your answer contribute to those anonymous uh, reports. Um, similarly, what Paul talked about earlier is this concept of being able to find your twin. So let's say I have multiple myeloma. It auto-populates these genetic things that I have. So let's say I wanna see all myeloma patients who have a deletion of 13, and I wanna run the search. You'll be able to see patients if they had treatment centered or no treatment centered, how long they lived after diagnosis and their age, but you'll not be able to see that individual or who that person is. And you'll be able to see what they had for therapy and how they responded. This is live information anonymized from patients by showing their lines of therapy, their outcomes and side effects by line of therapy. And then you can message them. It basically gets, sends them a friend request and we'll be developing um, this, this in an, chat. In an anonymous time. way, you can communicate them and ask them questions about the treatment. We haven't addressed this Accelerate Myeloma research. Somebody asked a question about the COVID study. The COVID study is going great. We have 1,038 people who joined the COVID, COVID study. Um, okay, and then any other questions? All right. So somebody asked, uh, can I cover the Ancestry.com question I mentioned earlier? So yes, there are two things we learned about Ancestry.com. Number one is how do you frame the question? We talked about genealogy versus family history. And what, and when we, we started talking about in terms of family history, I said, are you, tell me about your genealogy. People are like, I don't do that. Tell me about your family. Oh, you, you can't stop talking about your family. And so in terms of how we frame the questions to people, it was, Give me your data. Oh, my data is, I want to protect it. Tell me about your, your cancer journey. And people won't stop talking. So part of it is the framing of how do we share our stories with each other? And so it was one of the things that we learned from the, doing genealogy is we can't wait to share our story because our story is helpful to everybody else. And so think of Health Tree as a platform so you can share your story, not with the stranger next to you, but with all living myeloma patients and by sharing our stories with each other, it creates every node on the network makes the network stronger, and we become uh, it becomes this nice uh, fabric and this very strong community. So that's one of the lessons we learned. The second thing we learned is that the value of data, because you have this underlying changing data under the system, and you have new lab values coming in, and new research is coming in, new videos are coming in. And so go back to the main dashboard, Jenny. And so we're going to be able to go back and show you in context. Um, so you see two friend requests coming in. You're going to have messages on your panels that will share you in context of 
the changes that are happening underneath, how that relates to you. So we're gonna basically connect you with the, all the different changes and put this in context for you. So think of it as um, not personalized care, but optimized care. We're optimizing for the current knowledge that we have. How can we help you best at the situation? And we'll continue to deliver more services back to the individual patients based on the community coming in, getting stronger and stronger. So those are the two lessons, leveraging the machine learning data on the back end, plus framing it and putting it in real context. So we're just, we're sharing stories with each other to help each other. Yeah, and that goes to Mike's question. So Mike's question was just about a clinical trial and should he keep going with some of the treatment or should he stop? And, then, and he's having a hard time understanding the risk reward. As patients, we're making those calls every single day. What's the risk benefit? for me um, and I'm weighing those every day, my side effects versus do I want a longer remission? Um, like I would say in general, and I'm happy to talk to you individually about this in your own situation, but in general, um, the doctors want to see you do a stem cell transplant followed up with multi-year maintenance therapy most likely because once they have that deep remission, you wanna continue it, but only at a tolerable uh, level. And, um, and um, that's something that once our, we add more reports, you can actually see in a report, what is the risk benefit? Because we're asking for side effects and we're asking for therapy and you'll be able to see a report. Okay, if I stay on therapy, how long is the average remission? And then I'm starting to make just really logical decisions around my care. So that's, it's a great question. Yeah. Well, there's, um, there's a few more questions out there. Uh, Gary Stark has a question around, uh, should we enter our genetic information from Ancestry.com? Um, that talks about who you are and your family history. And as more genetic information is, I think, uh, a broader question, should we generate a genetic, um, should we analyze our genome? Because it's interesting. It's cheaper for us to analyze our genome to enter the information from your medical health records. <laughs> yeah. So I think sometime we, at some time in the future, we should create a, identify a partnership with a, a genome company where we can enter the genome and that information did could be, could it, it might be informative. We don't know if it is right now, but that would be amazing to do that. So that's a great, that's a great idea. And so, yeah, we, we want to close now, but we just thank you so much for joining. Um, our team is here to help you at all times and um, you can reach out to us individually. You can reach out to us on the chat. You can call the Wayne 800 number. Um, if anybody wants to chat with me individually as well, the team can forward that on to me and I'm happy to give you a call. And um, thank you so much for joining HealthTree and for sharing this because it's only together that our data is valuable. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.